my talk today is really intended to set us up to think about the subject that we're talking about here today, the space between. And they left it open to us as to what this meant. And my first reaction was, yes, even though I had no idea what that really meant. <laughs> but I know that in the space between, there is a lot to talk about when it comes to women and power. And here we are in one of the most powerful cities in the world. There is a lot to talk about. And I think through today, you're going to get a lot of different impressions about women and power. And our hope is that you leave with your own impressions about women and power in a new way that maybe you're not thinking about it right now. So in the power of story is often an opportunity to transform ourselves personally. So I would like to take an opportunity to tell you a story within a story within a story and we'll see what happens. This story starts last August in the Shenandoah foothills where a feminist author goes to a family reunion. And a few hours, a couple drinks, lots of hugs later, he finds himself on a porch. And yes, this feminist author is a man. <laughs> and he finds himself on a porch in a big rocking chair, rocking and talking to the one cousin who just doesn't quite get it you know, can't really follow the argument. And that cousin was me. And we were joined, just to make the conversation more interesting, we were joined by our little niece, who's not so little anymore because she's now a women's study student at university. And the three of us were having this intense discussion about the story of today's woman and who's the main character in that story. Because there's a lot of data that's come out in the last five years in particular about women out of governments, out of consultancies, out of universities, that's putting a new character in our story. And this discussion we were having on the porch was very lively, and the family members who came in and out of it were very puzzled. Here are three people dedicated to helping women find power and influence in the world, and we didn't even see the world the same way. We didn't see the women the same way. We couldn't even agree on who the main character was in this story. So what I'd like to do is bring you into our conversation and tell you the story of the new women in the story, one of which I've named the underdog princess, <laughs> and the other I've named the tragic queen. And I'd like to tell you their stories through the lens of the data that we have available to us today, so you can start thinking about this yourself. We'll start with the tragic queen, because the tragic queen is someone we know and love. She's very dear to us, and she needs our support. When the tragic queen is a child, she's very ambitious. She's very smart. The data tells us she's just as ambitious and just as smart as all the little boys she plays with. But when she gets into her teens, some of the stories from her playmates and from her parents and from the media around her start to become louder inside her than her own ambition. And in her teens, she's not acting as smart as she is. She's not expressing as much ambition as she did when she was a child. And she's not seeking recognition for her own accomplishments, and she has a lot of accomplishments. Now we fast forward into the workplace, and she's now 52% of the American workforce, but she's only making 20 to 30% as much as the guy in the cube next to her doing the same job. She does get support. She's mentored 7% more than he is, but that results in 37% less chance that she'll get promoted because of it. Now, if she targets going into a leadership position in her company or in the world, she has a pretty low chance of success, about 15%. And if she wants to go all the way to the top, like to a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, her chances are even slimmer, 4%. Along the way, she runs into a vast network of all kinds of barriers, visible and invisible, like employment policies that are very inflexible right at the time in her life when she needs flexibility. Or stereotypical attitudes on the behalf of the hiring managers that, who just assume she's not really interested in certain jobs so they never offer her the opportunity to compete for them. And these prejudices aren't just held by men. Many of the prejudices that she runs into are held by women too. They're cultural realities. They're cultural stereotypes we all share about what a leader looks like. The data tells us we all believe 
that a leader has masculine qualities and that when women try to be a leader the way our culture tells us we should be, it makes her unattractive. So our tragic queen is faced with this very uncomfortable decision as she goes forward in her career. Does she try to seek power or does she try to stay feminine? And is that a trade-off she has to make? Along the way, she's internalizing a lot of these messages and stories into what I call kind of a glass ceiling in her own self-confidence. And so she's not as comfortable talking about what she's accomplished or what she wants to accomplish. She's very good at negotiating on behalf of other people, but not on behalf of herself. And even if she makes it into the boardroom, she is still engaging in behaviors that are undermining her own leadership credibility, like apologizing for what she's going to say before she says it four times more often than the men she's sitting next to. Our tragic queen is not a happy person. She's 25% less likely to be happy at work. She's 8% less likely to be happy at home. And it's no wonder because she does 58% of the home care, child care, and elder care when she's not working. In the end, our tragic queen decides she can't have it all, and so she doesn't. Now let's contrast that with this new character in our story. I call her the underdog princess. And the data tells us she's a very successful businesswoman, but our blockbuster movies last summer tell us she's a girl with a bow and arrow, that I think is a wonderful image to hold for her. She starts off just like the tragic queen, as a child, very ambitious, very smart. She gets exposed to all the same media messages and social messages in her teens. It's not clear she internalizes them quite the same way. She goes on to earn 58% of the undergraduate degrees in our country and over 50% of our PhDs and master's degrees. She makes it into that upper tier of leadership 15% of the time and she does it because she's very good at what she does. She's ranked by her superiors and her peers and her staff as excelling on 15 out of 16 key leadership traits over the men that she works with. She's more trusted by her staff. She's able, if she's an investor, to produce results up to 23% greater than her male colleagues. She's able to master the most complex leadership characteristics needed by our society and our economy today. And I'm talking about the, the innate ability to use her emotional intelligence, her social intelligence, leadership skills like conflict management and self-awareness. And she can master a broad set of leadership styles all the way from consensus building to command and control and use them appropriately so that when she has mastered these she's promoted one and a half times more frequently than the guy in the office next to her who's also mastered these skills. Now when she makes it into a corporate board something really interesting and amazing happens especially if she makes it there with other women in a special ratio of three to ten so thirty percent when 30% of that board is represented of women, something really special happens in that company. And it is able to produce results dramatically better than other companies with no women on their boards. Now, what do I mean by dramatic results? Well, 84% higher return on sales, 60% higher return on invested capital, 46% higher return on equity. Those companies are more socially responsible, they're more sustainable, they're more philanthropically generous. And while this data is not causative, it does not say that the women themselves produce those results. The correlation across sector, across geography, and across research organization is so compelling and so strong that we know something really special is happening there. And I call it the woman effect. You'll also hear it referred to as the 30% solution. And we'll come back to this because it's very important. Our underdog princess manages to renegotiate relationships with the men in her life. She's much more likely to have one, a partner who's one of the job flexible fathers that the 2010 census now tells us are raising 30% of our toddlers. She makes more money than her husband 40% of the time. And in the end, the underdog princess decides she can have it all by redefining it all. Now, Welcome back to the porch <laughs> and the conversation that my cousin and my niece and I were having on this complex set of information. And I think you can see now, I'm telling you a little bit of a fiction, aren't I? 
the data is not on two different women. The data is telling us conflicting stories about ourselves. In fact, the tragic queen is an excellent leader and is running successful businesses. And the underdog princess is certainly facing cultural barriers and stereotypes. They're both struggling with their own self-confidence and a glass ceiling in their own self-confidence and self-worth. They're both dealing with sexual abuse far too often. And they're both struggling to have it all in a world where there's so much to have, it just doesn't all fit. Now the best of my ability to tell the true difference between the women who are living the storyline of the tragic queen and of the underdog princess has nothing to do with what statistical buckets they might fit in, has nothing to do with their age. It has everything to do with their perspective. Do they encounter a cultural barrier in their journey <coughs> to leadership as an opportunity to take a necessary step and take a challenge on in their leadership journey? Or do they see it as justification for their own self-doubt? Do they see a stereotype in the culture that look, makes leaders look like males as a reason to trade off their femininity or not go into leadership? Or do they see it as an opportunity to establish a new form of leadership built on the very foundation of their femininity? In these small but deeply important decisions that the women today are making about how to deal with the barriers and struggles that we all face, in those small and deep decisions, they are gaining power in their lives or they're reinforcing their powerlessness. Now, because of those personal decisions, it's completely appropriate that my cousin and my niece and I are not writing the happy ending to this story, much less its next chapter, much less deciding who the main character is. Because it's not our story to write, it's your story to live. And I keep asking myself, the statistics say the tragic queen still wears the crown. But where do we find our heroines and our heroes? Do we find them in the statistical majority or do we find them out on the emergent edge? And I'll leave that question with you too. But I will tell you that on the way to dinner that night, my niece told me she was very intrigued with the underdog princess and she was gonna look into getting herself a bow and some arrows. And I find that personally really hopeful. But since this story is now yours, I want to tell you one more piece of information and I hope you find it as meaningful and as in, uh, empowering and as inspiring as I do. Last year, some researchers got together from Carnegie Mellon and um, MIT Sloan School and they did a study to find out what made groups of people smart. Like if you put a bunch of high IQ people together, would they produce better results? Or if you had a group of really excited people that liked working together, would they produce better results? So they took 700 people at random, men and women, between the ages of 18 and 60. And they assigned them to small groups and they gave them problems and puzzles and conundrums that were sort of proxies for the complicated problems that we all face in our world. And they set them off and they brought the results back and they didn't find any correlation between group success and um, individual intelligence. And they didn't find any correlation to group motivation or other kinds of group dynamics, there was only one factor that predicted the success of a group, and it was the presence of women. Now, it wasn't the presence of any random number of women. It was the presence of women in a ratio of three to 10. And if you remember, that's what I said was working in those corporate boards. When there are 30 to 70% women in a group, that group is demonstrably more successful whether they're on a corporate board or an average group of women and men in a study or frankly this explains why developing organizations are putting so much energy and money into supporting women and girls in developing economies because they too find that when women are participating in developing economies at a 30 percent or more ratio those economies are healthier they're wealthier they're more stable and I believe that this study has begun to isolate the secret sauce of the woman effect. And when the researchers were asked, why did the groups with women perform so well? <laughs> What's the mystery? They said the same thing that I hear from leaders when I work with them on establishing balanced and effective leadership cultures. And that is that where women are present, 
the dialogue shifts, the group dynamic changes. More ideas get on the table. There's a greater tolerance for discussion and ideation. And before you know it, more brains get a crack at the problem and there's more solutions to consider. And guess what? The results get better. And the woman effect happens not because those women have more degrees than everybody else, not because they have more experience, not because they have no self-confidence issues, <laughs> and not because they try harder than anybody else. They're able to create that effect because they're present, because they're there and they're participating. That's the secret sauce of the woman effect, whether it's on a corporate board in an African village or in the next meeting you go to after this presentation. Now, <laughs> what was true for those women in that study is true for you. One of your greatest powers in this world has nothing to do with anything you earned or learned or were given. It's in your bones and your blood, and it shows up when you show up and participate. And the study says, even if you don't value it, it shows up anyway when you show up and participate. Now, I encourage you to value it, but the point is, you don't have to wait until you're brimming with self-confidence to make the woman effect possible in the world. Because when you show up and participate and you put yourself into it and other women join you, the woman effect is activated and the world gets better. So I have one request for you. Don't worry whether you're the tragic queen or whether you're living the story of the underdog princess. They're a fiction. Remember, I told you that. <laughs> Don't worry if you have uh, an internal glass ceiling or an external glass ceiling. By worrying about it, you just give it power and it drains you. My request to you is, on behalf of a world that wants to get better, show up, participate a little beyond your comfort zone. Because the statistics of the tragic queen tell us not enough women are doing this. So when you show up and participate a little beyond your comfort zone, you encourage the women around you to do the same. And before you know it, you're activating the woman effect and the world is getting better. And you don't have to do any more than that. Show up, participate a little beyond your comfort zone. That's all you have to do. And the world will get better. So thank you. You've got to be one. <laughs>